Welcome to the Central Point and Shady Point Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School service. I'm so glad that you've just decided to um, join us today. And uh, we have an exciting lesson that is going to be brought to us by Larry Edwards. And I know he's been uh, preparing and praying uh, over this lesson. And I'm looking forward to listening to see what God is going to speak through him. The title of the lesson for today is The Bible as History. There's a lot of uh, history in this book, this wonderful book which we call the Bible. And so uh, we need to uh, open this up uh, and open especially our hearts as we study the Word of God. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and let's pray that God would give us that open mind and open heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the Word of God. But the Word of God is just like the seed that is described in the parable of the sower and the seed. If the seed does not penetrate into the soil, the devil comes, just like the birds come, and snatches away that seed, and it doesn't do any good. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that our hearts would not be hardened like the wayside soil, but our hearts would be soft and tender, and that as we hear the word of God, that it would penetrate deep inside of our souls, and that we would receive that into our very being, and that it would germinate and bear fruit for the kingdom of God. So, Lord, I pray a prayer of blessing upon Larry Edwards. May the Spirit of Jesus come upon him, and uh, may the Spirit teach him so that he totally and completely disappears, and the Spirit is seen as the teacher, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. History, according to Webster's Dictionary, is an account of facts, particularly of facts respecting nations or states, a narration of events in the order which, in which they happened with their causes and effects. So this week, we've been looking at the Bible as a historical book, which, according to the definition, is the narration of the events in the order in which they happened with their causes and effects. The great controversy is over the character of God. Is God good? Does he have the best interests of the universe on his heart? Since the Bible is a record of the dealings of God with mankind, we learn of God's mercy and justice from how he dealt with the rebellion on this earth and the great sacrifice of his son. In other words, history is important very important. Our memory verse is found in Exodus chapter 20 where God presented the Ten Commandments to Israel. And I read Exodus 20 and verse 2. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Before presenting the law, the God revealed himself to Israel as the one who had delivered them from the bondage of Egypt. He had spared them from the plagues that were poured out. He had led them out of Egypt, and when the army of the Egyptians pursued them, and they were trapped on the shore of the Red Sea, God opened the waters, and the Israelites passed through as on dry ground. The Egyptians who tried to follow them were destroyed. God had delivered Israel, and we can learn from that history. In looking at Wikipedia and other sources, some even Jewish, I was astonished to find that many of them say that the Exodus is a myth, saying there is no archaeological evidence. In view of the material on Wikipedia and some other places, there appears, appears to be some effort to view history in a way to invalidate the Bible record, not just the Exodus, but other events which we have looked at this week. Now, to illustrate this bias, I would like to read a quote from a, man who, from a man who taught philosophy at New York University. His name is Thomas Nagel. I've never met this man. I have no contact with him, but I'm using him to illustrate a point. I quote, I want atheism to be true, 
And I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally I hope that I'm right in my belief. It is that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the, the universe to be like that. Ideally, there should be no bias when looking at the evidences for and against the Bible history of the earth. But I think you would agree with me that from the quotation from Thomas Nagel, this is not the case, certainly not in this case. And before starting, I'd like to read one more quote from a secular author. His name is George Orwell. I have not read his books such as 1984 and Animal Farm, nor am I recommending them. But the, court, the quote is illustrative, and I quote, the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. If there is any truth to this quote, then there is no wonder why there seems to be such an effort to create questions concerning the Bible record of history. There is evidence for creation and for the great flood, but there seems to be an effort to interpret these, interpret these evidences to support evolution and, and deny the Bible record. But given the bias of our culture, we must not look for secular science and history to validate the Bible record of history. So we will look at records, events recorded in the Bible for which some have external evidence and some do not. In the book Steps to Christ, the author writes, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason, and this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have plenty of opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. So with that introduction, let's go to Sunday's lesson. And I'm reading from 1 Samuel 17, verses 3 through 10. You probably have read this before. It's a story, a famous story, of David and Goliath. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are ye come out to set yourselves, set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye, the servants to Saul, choose you a man to fight for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day, Give me a man that we may fight together. A very familiar passage. We teach it to our children. And we've read how Goliath taunted the army of Israel. We have read how David came to Goliath, picked up smooth stones and slung one in a sling, and then struck the Philistine and, and killed him with his own sword. We read in this event how God worked in a mighty way to use this young man to deliver Israel. And God will work in your life and mine as we commit ourselves to him and seek to follow him. Critics of the Bible question if Goliath and Saul and David ever existed. 
And while I was not able to find any direct evidence for the existence of Goliath, that does not prove he does not exist. There have been many instances where a city was known only from the Bible record, only later to discover that very city in archaeology. As far as David is concerned, there have been two inscribed stones with the phrase translated, House of David. There also was an inscription with the name of Saul's son, Ithbosheth, who ruled for two years. And you can find that at www.ancient.eu slash king underscore David with the, key, the K and the D uh, in capital letters. If you have trouble, just search for King David. The fact that the Bible would record the sin of David with Bathsheba would tend to support its divine inspiration. Also, so would the instance incident with Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom with the rebellion of Absalom. If it was only of human design, the dark spots would be covered up. In Monday's lesson, we look at Isaiah, Hezekiah, and Sennacherib. And Isaiah 36, 1, now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up, came up against the defense cities of Judah and took them. There's actually quite a bit of information on the internet on Sennacherib. Going to Wikipedia article, which is hardly uh, supportive of the Christian viewpoint, they say, though it is clear that the blockade of Jerusalem ended without significant fighting, how it was resolved and what stopped Sennacherib's massive army from overwhelming the city is uncertain. If one searches, searches for the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem on Google and go to the Wikipedia article, according to the records attributed to Sennacherib, he did bring siege against Jerusalem, but it is the only city recorded that he did not capture. His records, however, fail to indicate why he did not capture Jerusalem. So we do see that some aspects of secular history do line up with sacred history. But before we go on, we need to read why God would work in such a drama dramatic and drastic way. Rab Shekha, and I hope I'm saying his name right, was the spokesman for the king of Assyria. Let us look at a small portion of what he said. I will be reading from Isaiah 36, verses 18 through 20. And he said, Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his hand out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Now, with that, let's go and look at the response of Hezekiah. And I'm skipping down to Isaiah 37, verses 14 through 20. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel that dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which has sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore have they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, I, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. And God did respond and defended his name, for we read in verse 36, then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. 
This parallels an early experience which is found in 1 Kings chapter 20. I will be reading verses 23 through 29. This is not Assyria, this is Syria. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we, will, we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened to their voice and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and, all, and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pinched before them like two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord, is the, the Lord is the God of the hills, but he is not the God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was on the, that on the seventh day, the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. Here we read again how God will work to defend his name. Unless we become too self-confident, God will often works in spite of his people because the name of the king in Israel in this passage was King Ahab, as we can read in verse 14. Let's go on to Tuesday's lesson. Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skill, skillful in all, all wisdom, cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. There is considerable archaeological evidence for the life of Nebuchadnezzar, including the conquest of Jerusalem and the fact that he had many members of prominent families taken back to Babylon. Also, there is archaeological evidence for Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, his son. Daniel and his three friends were witnesses to Nebuchadnezzar. Many of us are familiar with the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel also gave the interpretation and counsel to the king when he dreamed of a large tree that was cut down in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel gave Belshazzar the interpretation of the letters written by that mysterious hand tra traced upon the wall in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel was a faithful witness to King Darius in Daniel chapter 6, and God preserved his life after being thrown into the lion's den. And Daniel was given visions in Daniel 7 all the way to Daniel 12, which we need to understand to prepare us for the events which are transpiring in this world today. Why could God use Daniel in such a mighty way? It says in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart. When faced with a choice of following God or following the pressures which the world placed upon him, Daniel purposed 
or chose to follow God. In an article called Youth Instructor, October 25th, 1894, is the following quotation. The youth should stand in a position where their hearts may be wholly the Lord's, where they are honoring God with their strength. God will then honor them by giving them knowledge and wisdom. Thus did Daniel in the courts of Babylon, standing true to principle amid the corruptions of the heathen. And then by the same author in a book called Prophets and Kings, page 486. True success in any line of work is not the result of chance or accident or destiny. It is the outworking of God's providences, the reward of faith and discretion, of virtue and perseverance. Fine mental qualities and a high moral tone are not the result of accident. God gives opportunities. Success depends upon the use we make of them. While God was working in Daniel and his companions to will and to do his good pleasure, they were working out their own salvation. Herein is revealed the outworking of the divine principle of cooperation, without which no true success can be attained. Human effort avails nothing without divine power, and without human endeavor, divine effort is with many of no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our part. His grace is given to work in us to will and to do, but never as a substitute for our own effort. Is there anything which is keeping any of us from purposing in our hearts to follow God? May God help us to live for him today. Wednesday's lesson talks about the historical Jesus. And I'm going to first start by reading a couple of verses in John chapter 18, verses 28 and 29. Then led they from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? Regarding Pontius Pilate, Wikipedia has this. A single inscription from Pilate's governorship has survived the so-called Pilate stone, as have coins that he minted. The Jewish historian Josephus and philosopher Philo of Alexandria both mention incidents of tension and violence between the Jewish population and Pilate's administration. There is no doubt of his existence. And Wikipedia has this on Caiaphas. The first century Jewish historian Josephus is considered the most re reliable extra-biblical literary source for Caiaphas. His works contain information on the dates for Caiaphas's tenure of the high priesthood, along with reports on other high priests, and also helped to establish a coherent description of the responsibilities of the high priestly office. And on Wikipedia, a source which is not favorable, in my opinion, to the Christian viewpoint, it has this on Jesus. Early non-Christian sources that attest to the historical existence of Jesus include the works of the historians Josephus and Tacitus. Josephus scholar Louis Feldman has stated that few have doubted the genuineness of Josephus' reference to Jesus in Book 20 of the, of the Antiquities of the Jews, and it is disputed only by a small number of scholars. Tacitus referred to Christ and his execution by Pilate in book 15 of his work, Annals. Scholars generally consider Tacitus' reference to the execution of Jesus to be both authentic and of historical value as an independent Roman source. And one more quotation from Wikipedia. Non-Christian sources are valuable in two ways. First, they show that even neutral or hostile parties never show any doubt that Jesus actually existed. Second, they present a rough picture of Jesus that is compatible with that found in Christian sources, that Jesus was a teacher, had a reputation as a miracle worker, had a brother, James, and died a violent death. 
Now let's go to Thursday, faith and history. And we're starting with Enoch. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. We don't know a lot about Enoch, but there is another passage in Genesis, and I will read that in verse, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, for he was not, for God took him. Enoch was born about 622 years after Adam and Eve were created. He was translated about 57 years after Adam died. The world had become very wicked, for we read in the book of Jude, verses 14 and 15, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and all of their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. What can we learn from the life of Enoch? He was living in a wicked time. But in Hebrews chapter 11, 5, it says that he pleased God. How did he please God? How did he please God? <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it tells us how. How he and how we can please God. It is written, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what does this verse tell us about Enoch? and his faith. First, he believed not just that God existed, for in James 2.19 it says the, the devils believe and tremble, but that God will reward those who seek him diligently. In the book Desire of Ages, the author writes, it is not enough to believe about Christ, we must believe in him. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him as a personal savior, which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. Saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relation with God. Enoch had that faith. Living in a corrupt society, he walked with God. His example is for us. Noah, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah was, Noah was born only 59 years after the translation of Enoch. Given that men lived 900 years at that time, 10 times as long as what we live today, 59 years really is a fairly short time. What can we learn from the faith of Noah? Well, first of all, what were the conditions under which he lived? What was it like to be in the world at that time? Genesis 6 and verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Yet Noah was faithful to God. Genesis 6, 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Let's look at evidences of the faith of Noah. God asked Noah to build a very large boat, an ark. We read about that in Genesis chapter 6, starting with verse 13. God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. 
Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Up to that time, it had never rained. For in Genesis 2, 5, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a, a man to till the ground. Now imagine that you were living when there had never been rain on the earth. You are asked to build a boat because the Lord is going to cause water to rain from the skies, something that never happened before. Now Noah was the tenth generation. If every generation had only four children, then there would have been more than one people in the tenth generation if there had not been widespread bloodshed. bloodshed. We don't know that. But if there had not. If each family had six, then there would be more than 60 million people in the 10th generation. And if each family had eight children, there would have been more than 1 billion people in the 10th generation. What would it have been like if almost all of them looked at you as if you were crazy? And if it took you 120 years to build the ark, they would do this day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. Yet Noah continued. He did have help. His dad Lamech died five years before the flood, and his grandfather Methuselah died the year of the flood. Noah had great faith. Next, let's go to Abraham. Abraham and we read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he, was called, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterwards receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city with hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. After the flood, things went downhill quickly. Those who did not wish to be restrained by God's law built the Tower of Babel, likely during the life of Peleg, the great, great, great grandson of Noah and the great, great, great grandfather of Abraham. I'm reading out of Patriarchs and Prophets. After the dispersion from Bab uh, Babel idolatry, after the dispersion from Babel, Idolatry again became well nigh universal, and the Lord finally left the hardened transgressors to follow their evil ways, while he chose Abraham of the line of Shem and made him the keeper of his law for future generations, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 125. So God called Abraham to leave his family, and God led Abraham to the land of Canaan, it was a beautiful land, for when the children of Israel were called out of Egypt, the land of Canaan was described as a land flowing with milk and honey. But who were the Canaanites? Were they followers of the one true God? In Genesis 9, we see that they were the descendants of one of the sons of Ham. Uh, descendants of one of the sons of Ham. Ham was the one who looked upon his father when Noah drank of the grape juice which had, been per, which had become fermented, and Noah was in his tent and not clothed. Under the inspiration of God, Noah foretold what would be the future of the descendants of his three sons, and addressing Canaan, the son of Ham, instead of Ham himself. It was a fair and goodly country that the patriarch had entered, a land of brooks, of waters, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil and oil, olive and honey, Deuteronomy 8, verses 7 and 8. But to the worshiper of Jehovah, a heavy shadow rested upon the wooded hill and fruited, fruitful plain. The Canaanite was then in the land, Abraham had reached the goal of his hopes to find a country occupied by an alien race and overspread with idolatry. In the groves were set up altars of false gods, 
and human sacrifices were offered upon the neighboring heights. Patriarchs and Prophets, 127. Abraham's example was not perfect. He had his feelings. Twice he said that Sarah was his sister. He listened to Sarah and had a son by Hagar. How could someone who had been so unfaithful be included in the chapter of faith? In Genesis 22, starting with verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Abraham was 120 years old. He was considered old even in his day. Isaac was a young man of only 20. The Bible says that on the third day they came to Mount Moriah. Abraham and Isaac left the servants behind and climbed the mountain with the wood and the fire, but no sacrifice. Reaching the appointed place, they built the altar and placed the wood upon it. And Abraham explained to his son what God has asked him to do. He binds his son and places him on the altar. And continuing in Genesis 22, verses 10 through 13. Abraham, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, Neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by, its, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Why would God make such a request to Abraham. Patriarchs and Prophets 154. It was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel, as well as to test his faith, that God commanded him to slay his son. The agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. No other test could have caused Abraham such torture of soul as did the offering of his son. So it was a test of his faith. And then in the first volume of the Spirit of Prophecy set, page 101, Abraham has now fully and nobly borne the test and by his faithfulness redeemed his lack of perfect trust in God, which, which lack had led him to take Hagar as his wife. Sarah. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. This verse presents almost a paradox. It was at the suggestion of Sarah that Abraham had a son by Hagar. Fourteen years later, when God told Abraham that Sarah would have a son next year at this time, Sarah laughed, which is what the name Isaac means. Yet she stayed with Abraham for at least 62 years, left their family behind in Haran, remained faithful to him despite Abraham calling her, his sister, twice. And when the child of promise was weaned, seeking to protect the child from the jealousy of his older half-brother, she sought to have him sent away. The Apostle Peter also wrote of Sarah in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, 
Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Next, let's, let's go to Joseph. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Why would Joseph be an example of the faithful? He had remained faithful to God when tempted and when in prison. Joseph was about 39 when his father and, his, and the family left Canaan to live in the land of Goshen. He had already been in Egypt for about 22 years. He would live another 71 years in Egypt, so 93 of his 110 years would have been spent in Egypt, the greatest and most powerful nation at that time on the earth. He was second in command of Pharaoh, yet Egypt was not his home. He would come with his two sons to Jacob seeking a blessing before the patriarch died. He would ask to be buried in the earthly Canaan as a symbol of the heavenly Canaan where his citizenship was. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where three thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of, of the reward. Moses was fitted to take preeminence among the great of the earth, to shine in the courts of its most glorious kingdom and to sway the scepter of its power. His intellectual greatness distinguishes him above the great men of all ages as historian, poet, philosopher, general of armies, and legislator, legislator he stands without a peer Yet with the world before him, he had the moral strength to refuse the flattering prospects of wealth and greatness and fame, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Patriarchs and Prophets, 245. For 40 years, he herded sheep. Many would have dispensed with that long period of toil and obscurity, deeming it a great loss of time. But infinite wisdom called him, who was to become the leader of his people, to spend 40 years in the humble work of a shepherd. The habits of caretaking, of self-forgetfulness, and tender solicitude for his flock, thus developed, would prepare him to become the compassionate, long-suffering shepherd of Israel. No advantage that human training or culture could bestow could be a sub substitute for this experience also Patriarchs and Prophets, 247. So Moses was called to lead Israel from Egypt to the Promised Land. What should have been a relatively short trip ended up taking 40 years. Time after time, the people complained. There were those who wanted to have another leader. There were the serpents. But there was one time when Moses failed. The first time when there was no water, Moses was to strike the rock Exodus 17, 6. The second time he was to call upon the rock. Numbers 20, verses 7 through 11. But he became angry and struck the rock instead and ruined the lesson it was to teach. Christ suffered once for our sins and all who call upon him will be saved. Christ is the rock. He was cleft for you and me. From him comes the living water. Aside from that one time when Moses failed, his life is a worthy example of one who esteemed the reproach of Christ of greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. 
Hebrews 11.31 By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. Who was Rahab? Well, Judges chapter 2 and verse 1, she lived in Jericho. Also, her occupation on, in that is not something that is mentioned in polite society. According to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, she was the mother of Boaz, which means she was the great, great grandmother of King David. How could Rahab be included in the list of Hebrews 11? Let's read about what it says in the book of Joshua, chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea, for you when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show, show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. In the city Jericho, worshiping various heathen gods, what was Rahab's view of the God of Israel? He is the God in heaven and earth. She viewed him as the true God. As in consequence of her, as a consequence of her belief in the God of Israel, what did she do? She said to the men, when you conquer Jericho, which you will conquer since the true God is with you, preserve me and my family. In the book of James, it has this comment in James chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. In other words, true faith will be seen in by what we do in our lives. It will be more than just a profession. And Rahab had true faith. Samson. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell, fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Samson. There are some lives which we would do well to copy. There are some which we should not. And the life of Samson, unfortunately, is one of those lives. In Judges 14, he sings, sees a young woman of the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, and he does not ask his parents if he should be interested in her, but rather tells them that he wants her as his wife. Patriarchs and Prophets 562. The town of Zorah, being near the country of the Philistines, Samson came to mingle with them on friendly terms. Thus in his youth, intimacies sprang up, the influence of which darkened his whole life. Just as he was entering upon manhood, the time when he must execute his divine mission, the time above all others when he should have been true to God, Samson connected himself with the enemies of Israel. He did not ask whether he could better glorify God when united with the object of his choice or whether he was placing himself in a position where he could not fulfill the purpose to be accomplished by his life. To all who seek first to honor him, God has promised wisdom, but there is no promise to those who are bent upon self-pleasing patriarchs and prophets. 
page 563. I will skip one incidence in Judges 16.1 and go directly to Delilah. Many are familiar with this story. If you are not, please read Judges chapter 16, verses 4 through 21. Samson was beguiled by Delilah and it ended up revealing the secret of his faith and being taken as a prisoner of the Philistines. Some time later, there was a great festival of the Philistines celebrating that the captivity of Simon. And I will read starting with chapter 16, verses 25 through 30. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they said him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held, that held him by the hand, Suffer me, that I may feel the pillars upon which the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the Lord and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Samson had repented and turned back to God. He was included in the chapter of faith. If there are any listening to this who have wandered from God, please turn back. It is not too late. There is a story in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, where a son took his inheritance and left his father to go into a far country. He spent all that he had and ended up feeding pigs, which to a Jew would be the most degrading occupation. When he comes to himself, he decides he will go back to his father and work as a servant. So he turns to go to his father's home. He is dirty, clothed with rags. He is faint with hunger. His form is ravaged by the effects of sin. He has a speech all prepared. Years have passed, yet his father is still watching for his son. And he sees him from a far distance, and this old man runs to meet his son. He puts his rich mantle upon the wasted form and welcomes him back as his son. This was put in the Bible to remind us of the care which our Heavenly Father has for each of us and how he's waiting for us to return. If you have wandered, it's not too late to return. This week, our lesson has looked at people in the history who have been included in the list of faith. Most of them at times were less than faithful, and there, con and there were consequences for their failures. But God continued to draw them, and they responded to that drawing. If we are tempted to give up, let us remember how God is acquainted with every trial which we are facing and go to him for help. Our lesson has also looked at the Bible as a book of history in which we can see the dealings of God with people, faithful and unfaithful, yet with mercy. We have also seen that we cannot, we must not look to worldly books in order to validate our faith in the Bible. The issue is what is God really like? Is he worthy of our worship and service? For there is a war going on for your heart and for mine. With that, I would like to close with a verse from the book of Psalms, Psalms 34 and verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Thank you for joining us for this study, and I hope that each of you have a blessed Sabbath day. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
please help us to learn both from the good and the bad of those whose lives stories are recorded in your book and be reminded especially by the great sacrifice of your son but all through all your dealings with all the people that you really do care for us that you have the best interests of this universe upon your heart and that you cared so much for each of us that you gave your son that we might be adopted as your children So please bless us with your presence. Keep us by your grace. Help us that we may be faithful to you and a blessing to those around us. Amen.